I thought that I had time to do a better job preparing this presentation, but you might have seen the news, so it's been a busy week for us. Uh, if you've been following along, uh, if you've been uh, following along on the internet recently. Uh, so instead, I am going to do what I have uh, done in Extremis in the past here, which is use the same jokes and many of the same slides that I have used in previous years. Um, I hope that we will call this a remix and that you will all enjoy it. Um, so, uh, this year ended, or last year I was, I had to make a joke about how, uh, you know, every time I show up uh, to one of these presentations, I get a chance to say that, uh, you know, this has been, uh, it's, it's been a good year, it's been difficult, but we're ending on a high note, and then have something uh, bizarre and horrifying happen. Um, and, uh, you know, setting aside a mild case of insurrection and an ongoing state of COVID deniability, uh, COVID deny, COVID or vaccine denying uh, in North America, you know, a, in a mild case of um, Facebook assisted insurrection, I think I mentioned that, um, this year has actually uh, gone remarkably well. We knew that this was going to be a difficult rebuilding year uh, for the organization after a very, very difficult 2020. And the uh, not only have we, I think, done that, like we have rebuilt and reshaped the organization in a couple of really important ways, but we have also managed to get a lot of important, very focused things out the door uh, and into people's hands uh, in a way that is, you know, that is useful, that is going to not, not only, we hope, uh, drive towards, drive us towards greater market success, um, but also to change the fundamental nature of these markets in a lot of ways that we think continue to believe is important. Um, so that sort of sums up where we are and where we're going. Uh, there's more to say about that. So let's get started. Um, last year uh, opened with, last year we uh, closed off knowing uh, that after a series of layoffs, uh, that after uh, very, very difficult decisions to tighten and refocus a number of our product lines and shutter a number of our efforts, that this was going to be a year where we had to really narrow our focus on the most important things we could be executing on to develop a deep understanding of what those important things that we could be executing on are um, and to really just continue to like to make those things not better in some like abstract better sense but to actually drive material market impact to actually drive improvements in the product that are worth talking about that are worth having people speak for um, and that are worth choosing like that are just flat up worth choosing uh, as products. And uh, it's been a heck of a year of doing that. It's been a year, interestingly, where a lot of our efforts over the last, not just couple of years, um, but a lot of our projects, a lot of our goals have finally found themselves sharpened to a point and actually making real differences in how we work, how we are able to work, what decisions and what understandings we are able to make in the marketplace and how we can actually use the tools that we've spent a long time building to drive real change. Um, that doesn't always go exactly the way you want it to go. As you might imagine, it's been an exciting week for us uh, in terms of uh, the, the news on the internet. Um, I'm gonna talk more about that in a few minutes, but uh, it's, what I am going to say is sound very is going to sound quite disingenuous, for which I very much apologize. Um, but I hope you will bear with me while I walk you through what has happened here, and um, hopefully put your minds at ease about it. Um, but if not, I'm sure I'll be internet famous for a couple of days because of it. Let's see what happens. Um, this was the question. Uh, a couple of years ago, you might recall this slide on this screen saying where the question is, where do people really, really need us to be, right? Where do people need Mozilla to be? And this is the question that we have, uh, that goes to sort of the core of our mission, the core of our identity as a company, right? Is not just where do we want ourselves to be, but where do we want, you know, where do we want the role of Mozilla as an activist organization, as an organization with an ideological mission? Where is the most important place that, that mission can show up, right? And what do we need to do to make sure that we are providing a meaningfully different experience to people who find us there, right? And what can we do about that? And the answer um, 
is twofold, right? First of all, the answer is that we need to be more opinionated in more places, not less. We need to be like, if we're right, and the world needs us to not just be Mozilla, but to be who Mozilla says Mozilla is, then that's got to be the focus of this year. That's got to be where we've put 100% of our effort. And that place, right, that interaction is the user agent, that set of interactions, that set of, um, that set of places where people find themselves with us between them and the internet Right, and we have an opportunity in that moment to meaningfully make somebody's life better, safer, more secure, or like more interestingly, to play a more active role in that, right? To help people get to places, not just around the browser, but around the web in a more meaningful, in a more safe, in a more productive and healthier way, right? And so this year has been a lot, a lot of talking to of like refining our ways of interacting with our community, refining our ways of interacting with our larger audience. And one of the challenges that we have as an organization is that our community is like, our community already believes us, right? Our community has already decided that they're going to be using Firefox. And so if we want to grow, if we want to, you know, if we want to expand our focus, if we want to expand our audience, that means that the people we really need to aggressively seek out and foster a better understanding with and develop a better relationship with are not people who've already chosen the product. Right? And this is like this is spiritually very difficult because it means that we have spent a lot of this year putting people who've put a great deal of faith of, in us and invested a great deal of belief in Mozilla as an organization, we have had to put those wants and needs, not like not to throw them away, not to get rid of them, but we've had to deprioritize them in favor of really, really understanding where it is that we aren't, are not meeting the needs of people who don't already believe in us, who don't already choose us, right? What can we do to really understand who we need to speak to and find that audience so that as an organization, we can continue to grow. Um, and it's been a hard call. Um, like we can talk about building the tooling here, which we have, we can talk about building the processes, which we've worked very hard on. Um, but fundamentally, that also means that we are going to make changes that our most ardent believers, the people who want to believe in us the most, are going to have a hard time stomaching because that can't be our, that, like that's not our growth audience. That's not the highest potential audience or new places that we can be. And the world needs us to be there, right? I still actually am, I guess, naive enough to believe that the world actually, if, if the world understood what they were giving up in terms of privacy and agency and choice, by taking the default settings from large corporations. If people really understood that, they would choose, right? They would make other choices. If people understood what they give up or what their privacy is actually worth and knew that they had better choices, that they would make those choices. And our task for this year has been make sure that people know those things, make sure that people can find those choices and give people a set of distinct options that they can talk about. Some of those things are features, right? Some of those things are just new ideas that we have in our product that you can't get anywhere else, right? Releasing things like, uh, just as one example, this one came out in February. Uh, picture in picture uh, was good fun, right? Like you don't want, this is one of those things where it's a, it seems like a small thing until you go back to not having it and then you don't want to have that. But in the same release that we shipped this, we also shipped dramatically improved tracking protection called total cookie protection, right? So we have, you know, over the course of these releases, we've tried to aim for that kind of combination of stuff that is of value to people who just want their day-to-day -day driving experience to be better, but also people who are looking for like a continued commitment to this sort of deep-seated privacy, this deep-seated security uh, concerns that people have in the people on a modern internet, if you're aware of their concerns at all, tend to have, right? Moving further along, this is in May, and this is like this is a harbinger of things to come. Um, not just for the sake of this talk, not just for the sake of this uh, of this presentation, 
but this is the place where the user agent, I think, can have one of its greatest and most meaningful impacts, not by changing how we render a web page, uh, not by you know isolating cookies not necessarily, or by adding like individual privacy, as important as individual privacy remains, but to give us a chance to actually leverage that commitment to individual privacy, leverage this audience that we already ha that we have to try and change the actual ecosystem around us, to try and change the fundamental, the, like the nature of the ecosystem. Right? When I talk about being more opinionated, um, like unfortunately, and I don't like it, I think any more than anyone else does, but unfortunately adds power an awful lot of the internet. What makes the internet accessible to an awful lot of the world is the fact that it is being supported by the advertising industry. And the default settings for the advertising industry are eat everything, right? The default settings are gather as much information as we possibly can because we don't know if it'll be useful because we wanna make future correlations because we don't wanna throw anything out because, 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 right? To some extent, this is not just the default setting of the advertising industry, it's the default setting of computers, right? The easiest thing to do when disk space is basically free, right? And bandwidth is basically everywhere is to collect as much as you can. And in this glorious machine learning world that we have to try and understand your correlations later. Right? And this is, uh, this is in direct opposition to the principles about data gathering and data analytics that we have at Mozilla, which is that, look, there's no such thing as a fishing expedition. You're not allowed to do that. You need to say exactly what you need in the narrowest sense possible. You need to use it for only that, protect it from being used by anything else. And when you're done, you know, when you're done, don't keep the individual personal information any longer than you have to. And um, so that's May. And that's, uh, that's sort of, the, I guess, the beginning. Um, this slide is a fun one because this is a place where these tools that we've built, um, which again, like these tools that we built, it would, be, it would be great not to have to care about this stuff. I gotta tell you, like it must be so easy to work at a place where you don't mind doing A-B tests across your entire user base for any reason at any time. Like it must be astoundingly easy to get things done or to get numbers you can put on a graph when you don't actually care um, about whether or not you're gathering data at all, about how much data you're gathering, about you know limiting things and so on, um, it sounds like it sounds fantastic for a lot of reasons to be able to like just fall backwards into that kind of total information awareness, um, but we can't we can't do that um, because if we stop you know if we start doing that then we're not who we've always said we are. And again, it turns out that who we say we are continues to matter a lot. Um, that's the big news of this week, right? If anything else, that's the big lesson of the following week or the, the previous week that we've had is Mozilla is held to a higher standard for this. But now we've got tools that actually can in a safe, anonymized, no phishing expeditions, no personally identifiable information right? No privacy is violated way. Uh, actually understand and do user research about the state of the web browser and how people actually use this stuff. It's taken an enormous amount of effort for us to get to this point. And that set of tools now has built us, uh, given us this way that happened mid-year. And I've got my slides all in the wrong order now, or at least I don't even know if I have one here. Oh, I don't. I'm missing the slide that talks about this year's mid-year redesign. Right, the new Proton redesign, a dramatically new look that shipped a couple of uh, a couple of months ago, um, in the new Firefox, and it's really like it's really pretty, like it's it's simple, it's clean, it is easy to get used to. It is you know it's got light and dark modes uh, that make sense that are aesthetically pretty. It came with a raft of other improvements under the hood, of course, like privacy improvements. If your Mac OS experience um, is, if any of you are using Mac OS uh, to, you know, for Firefox, the power management situation there is night and day what it was six months or a year ago, like absolutely not comparable, right? Even on the even on the new M1 Max, right? This is 
faster and peppier. It, the product is faster and peppier than just about anything else out there. It's really, it's almost magical how much better it is. Um, and it's, it's better like that because we can make smarter decisions, right? It's better because we can, using these tools that have, again, that have been years in the making, uh, using tools, having the willingness to use these tools and to make priority decisions based on what these tools tell us um, to actually ship better products uh, and more meaningful products. And there's some other stuff we can do with them too. This one's fun. Uh, we haven't made a big, we haven't made a ton of huge noise about this, but this one is called Rally, right? Rally is a fascinating where, where we can essentially take these tools that we've developed that are privacy respect them. And in many respects, like, this is a very crude, like this is not a fair description of the product, um, but Rally is an opportunity to turn that essentially inside out. And for, for Rally is a crowdsourcing tool for gathering, oh, pardon me. Rally is a way that people can opt in to crowdsourcing their data when they are looking at sites, when they're looking at, uh, say, Facebook, um, who you may have heard in the news recently, uh, tried to deceive a great many of people researching the bad effects of Facebook. Um, because why would they make it easy for people who want to, you know, actually understand what's going on in Facebook, because then people might realize what Facebook is. Um, and of course, there have since been congressional subpoena, congressional uh, hearings on that front, and there will be more. Um, but this is a tool now that Firefox users, at least in the States at the moment, can opt into to uh, provide a second opinion, essentially, to provide a validation layer. Like we have a crowd that lets people see a data or aggregate their data in a safe, anonymous way, but that also lets researchers go back to the sites that they're analyzing. The Facebook can say, oh, that data you provided us with, that's not the real thing, right? We have a second, like we have a second opinion here about what you're actually showing people, about what people are actually doing. And you are right now attempting to deceive us. And it's a magnificent application of this idea that not only can the Firefox, like not only can all of these privacy respecting and you know, tools be used to ultimately speak truth to power at a very large scale, which is like, which is almost magical that it works as well as that does. Um, but it does give us also sort of a set of seeds, a set of, you know, a set of new ideas that we can build on that will make participating in the Firefox ecosystem, a possible, like a, just a small way to be a part of a force for good. And, and this is the result, like this entire exercise is the result of an enormous administrative and cultural and leadership and technical sea change at Mozilla that's gone on for the last eight or nine years. Um, pardon me, the last eight or nine, I, I would say six, six, to say, six to eight years. Right, where we've gone from this dogmatic, religious, like religiously dogmatic perspective that we should never touch any user data or handle any user data ever, through the realization that, you know, if we want to have meaningful relationships with humans in the world, that we have to understand something about them at some scale, right? Uh, all the while, like modern engineering practices, which care, frankly, very little for user privacy, will measure telemetry all the time everywhere. Um, just as part of a standard part of modern engineering. Uh, so it took us a great deal of time to get to the point now where we have not only realized that it is possible for us to hew to our values here and uphold privacy commitments while learning about people, learning about how our products are used in the aggregate, learning about how to handle this data safely um, in such a way that privacy, you know, in such a way that privacy is safeguarded and people are protected. Um, but also to get us to a point where we can start to leverage those tools for larger social, larger causes, right? To places where we, where other people in the world need to be able to have these kinds of safe insights and don't want to have them at the, you know, don't want to only have their insights at the behest of the people they're investigating. Like, I'm not sure what good it will do you to investigate Facebook using the data and tools that Facebook provides because Facebook knows exactly what's up, right? 
you need something else, you need another voice, you need some other way to look at these tools and to understand these things that does not rely on you trusting the very people you're trying to hold accountable, right? And trusting people, like the difference between trust and accountability is pretty important. Um, there's a whole story there, um, but let's get to the, the fun part, right? And this is the, this is like, this was announced September uh, 15th, I think, just a couple of days ago, which Firefox suggest, which is a second attempt, which is, as I mentioned earlier in the, uh, earlier in the call, um, which is our attempt to put the user agent between the human and the internet and to use that position as a force, not just for the good of the user, but to change the ecosystem for the better. Right. And the goal of this exercise has been, again, to grow our ability to, pardon me, not just to grow Mozilla's ability to handle data and to give people a better experience by understanding them, by understanding something about what they want, but to do so in a way that is honest, that is privacy respecting, that, that meets what we call the promise of Mozilla. Right, the expectations that your data is secure with us and we're not gonna opt you in to randomly sending your data everywhere or wherever um, without your explicit consent. Um, and it's pretty promising. I gotta say, we've gotten, uh, it's been an exciting week for the press, um, but the fact of it is that this is a significant change in approach for us, not just in terms of what we're trying to do because we are trying to do something new here. We are trying to handle more data in new ways. Um, we've built a whole ton of infrastructure to make sure that that continues to be safe, to make sure that that continues to be something that we can, that is trustworthy, but it is also, yes, new, right? And the most interesting thing from my perspective on this is that it has, I mean, as I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, where we have to find a way to you know, to meaningfully improve the lives of people who haven't set us as the default yet, right? We have to find a way to provide meaningful value and meaningful, like a meaningful internet experience to people who we want to join us on this journey, to people who we want to be able to derive value from Firefox as a daily driver. Um, and that has traditionally trying to make changes like that in and around Mozilla, where we are surrounded by people who care intensely about Mozilla, right? Who care intensely about their privacy, who care intensely about security, is that doing stuff that is new, even if it is new and promising, has always been really, really hard. And from my perspective, the most interesting thing about how this has shaken up is not that we're doing it. Like in some grand holistic sense, I could we've known for a while that we would have to become like an, a user agent that knows something about the user and has some sort of trustworthy barrier between them and the services of the internet and the larger internet. Um, we've known that was coming for a long time, but the thing that's very, like, very heartening to me is the fact that we have, after a great deal of like cultural work, after a great deal of evangelism internally, um, after a great deal of engineering work to make sure that we are confident that this is a possible approach, we have shipped it, we've put it out to market, not in the smoothest way, I will admit that is possible. And we've gotten a lot of pushback about that. And we are, I think, sticking to our guns. I wish I could say more about how we're sticking to our guns and what we're gonna say here and so on. This is still a thing that's in flight for us. Um, and I don't want to gainsay or commit my senior VP uh, to courses of action we haven't settled on yet, but I can tell you with some confidence that we think this is the right thing, right? That we think that this is not just a viable future for Firefox, but a better future for the web, right? And for the people participating in it. And that we want to have a role in that, um, in driving that change towards, you know, a user agent that is smarter and more responsible, that has services behind it that are delivered by trustworthy people who are not just selected by some organization for being trustworthy, um, but who are you know, bound by contracts and auditable code to act in a trustworthy manner. That 
but we can change the shape of the internet by really doubling down on this idea of being a user agent, your user agent. Um, and of course, if you disagree with us, right? If you don't want to participate in these efforts, the check boxes are all right there. Right? Um, so there's that. Uh, and on top of that, the mobile situation is great. Like this is, the mobile situation has gotten a little bit better, uh, not a little bit better. <laughs> I'm saying foolish things there. A uh, couple of weeks ago, uh, I was I was not part of the team that was uh, working on the major redesigns for our mobile clients that have come up very recently. Um, and I, uh, I bit my tongue at work when uh, people were talking about how great the new focus looked. Um, and how you know how the new mobile app, how the new mobile browsers uh, with you know Gecko View and a whole bunch of new tech built in, tracking protection, a whole bunch of new stuff uh, built in, focus that looks fantastic. Uh, I was still looking at the old stuff um, that had gone through some like there were minor improvements, like the logo was tightened up a little and the contrast was sharpened, and there were people in my channels going, "Man, this new redesign looks great," and uh, I you know, like a fool looked at that and I was like, and I saw the minor improvements, right? That had gone on to, that had crossed my radar to that point and said, oh yeah, that's, that's okay, right? And of course I find out six weeks later that what they're actually talking about is this beautiful thing, right? And a dramatic new improvement about this. And I feel like an idiot because what they were actually talking about while I was going, yeah, I guess that's okay, was actually the biggest improvement we've seen in mobile Firefox in a decade. Um, this is just, like, get yourself this. I don't care where you are, if you're on Android, if you're on Firefox, get to a place where you can get focus on your on your mobile device. It's fantastic. Um, likewise, the same is true. Uh, current versions of Firefox, the mobile clients are better than they have ever been. Uh, so much so, um, and I realized that this is sort of like a little bit of sleeping with the enemy here, but uh, so much so that uh, it was a featured app on iOS uh, a little while ago. Like it was just, you're featuring our browser, it's kind of like, it's not, I don't know how big a recommendation it is because on iOS, we still we still have to use their rendering engine. Um, but like the idea that you can set a new default browser there and that we have this growing user base of people who actually prefer us on iOS, that's pretty good. Because um, I mean, speaking bluntly, the, the standards for user interface elegance on iOS are usually among flagship things, usually quite high. And so it's gratifying there to see that the team's work has not only been recognized, but that has shown up in some really, really important places. Um, so yeah, there's a, like, there's a lot more I wanna talk about here. We're doing like the hubs team continues to do great work. Uh, there's a number of different efforts that we are under in the middle of right now that I just, I wanna talk about, I can't um, because I will be in like, well, I'll be unemployed um, if I spill the beans on some of this stuff at the moment. Uh, but this started out being started out with a rebuilding year. Like we knew this was going to be a hard rebuilding year. We knew we were going to have to ship some things and we knew we were going to have to change some things, but we did, right? We did that. It took a lot of work and took a lot of coordination from a lot of people. It took a lot of heartfelt conversations about how safe it felt, how much change we could manage what we were willing to do, what we were willing to endure uh, in many cases, because, you know, frequently when you change things, people get upset. Um, and I'm, I'm not unsympathetic uh, to people who want things the way they've got them and that we have to change things because we are per in the pursuit of new ideas for new user agents uh, and new browsers and in pursuit of new users been a hell of a year. It's been a quite a ride, uh, I got to tell you. And it's not over yet. And we've got a lot of things out the door that are really, really good, um, that are really, really promising. We're seeing active growth in a lot of places that, bluntly, I didn't expect to. Right? Mobile growth is, mo <laughs> our mobile teams are, are actually growing remarkably well. Um, uh, the user bases there are growing, um, and it's fantastic. A lot of people are trying, a lot of people uh, a surprising number of people uh, are setting us as the default on their phones, on their mobile devices. 
and I'm glad to see them there. Um, yeah, so um, I don't know that I often get to end on a high note like this, particularly considering there's still a bunch of stuff I want to tell you about, but can't. Um, the organization is uh, about as healthy and functional as it's ever been, uh, at least in my time here. Um, you know, we got some exciting press last week in which people said a bunch of things that weren't entirely correct about getting opted into stuff, but I can talk about that in a few minutes, sort of. Um, and yeah, so you asked about the state of Mozilla uh, and the state of Mozilla in 2021 is, uh, we're doing really well. We're on, like we're, I had the VPN, I think in here last time, the VPN continues to grow and be relevant as a market force. There is uh, the hubs team is doing really, really well and continues to grow that as well as a market force. The, um, you know, Firefox, new versions of Firefox, more new versions of Firefox on the way. Um, the mobile clients are fantastic and only getting better. Um, yeah, so that's the state of Mozilla 2021. I'm, uh, I feel good about it. I'm continue to be proud to work here. Um, and that goes a long way. Uh, and hopefully with, uh, hopefully with a little bit of faith and good fortune, the things we're doing now will not just improve the state of the internet browsing experience for people because the world needs that, um, but continue to actually change the underpinnings of that market in fundamental ways uh, that will bend the arc of history, at least as far as that market's concerned, towards privacy, towards security, towards you know, dignity and autonomy from people who do not want to be surveyed every moment of every day, wherever they go, which is, I think, a reasonable thing to ask for. And I think we can get people there. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Mike. Does anybody have any questions for Mike? Um, let's do this by uh, raising your hand. And you can do that uh, by clicking the reactions button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And then just uh, choose raise hand. That's how we'll moderate this. Uh, Hugh, you have a question. Well, I'm very honored to be uh, the first one picked. I'm. I, I should be the last, but anyway, I'll take advantage of it. Um, I have a bunch of questions, but the first one is, sorry, what happened last week that was so uh, scary, unpleasant and exciting? So uh, we, uh, the, the news around Firefox Suggest made the round. Um, and the claim made by many of the news articles was that Firefox is monitoring your keystrokes and that all of it is, you know, and you've been opted in to having all of your keystrokes monitored by Firefox, um, which, you know, I would expect in a, there is a better world out there where people say, you know, that doesn't sound like Mozilla to do that. Maybe we should dig deeper into our questions. Um, we're not in that world and you got to get your rage clicks um, because that's the nature of this market that I may have mentioned that we are trying to change. Uh, but it is true um, that we were, uh, that the, you know, the dialogue box around, the dialogue box that uh, Suggest was, uh, set, was shipped with um, was not 100% clear, uh, particularly not in light of an opt-in, uh, this idea of an opt-in service. I don't know if I should talk about this or not, but I'm going to, so go for me. Um, one of the things you can do with modern software is roll things out incrementally, right? You can roll out a, you can roll out features to some fraction of your user base. And this is a whole new thing for me. Like I, not that I, I, I knew you could do that, but I have never seen the failure mode yet where rolling out an opt-in feature to a larger audience only a small part of our audience, like a vanishingly small part of the Mozilla audience got this opt-in feature. But when the rest of the world who did not have that feature like offered to them yet, went into their preferences, they did not see an empty checkbox. They saw, they saw the usual default you know, stuff that we default to on when we ship it. 
and made the assumption that they had been opted in to something that they did not in fact have at all. Um, so that the thing that happened was we got a couple of press cycles out of that, a couple of unpopular press cycles out about that. And we are now, we are now in the process of seeking to, you know, learn from that, figure out everywhere that we can clarify the situation, document and so on. Um, however that shakes out, it turns out that exactly zero people in the world have had data leave their computers and come to Mozilla without their having given their express consent to have that done. Um, so we are treating it as a serious, like we're treating it as a PR incident, but it's not a technical incident because there has not actually been privacy. There have been no privacy losses incurred anywhere in the world to any human. So yeah, um, and that was last week's excitement. It's like. It is, and I have to say, it is consistently one of the most frustrating things about working for Mozilla is that, is that on the one hand, it is great that we are held to a higher bar like this. That is like, it is inspiring to work at a place where people care about what you're doing in a way and to a degree that no one will ever care about, you know, about Chrome or Safari. Right. It's an honor to work somewhere like that. But boy, when people think you've got it wrong, they get super angry and they, and they get super angry super fast. So uh, yeah, so that's what happened. And that's been my week. Wait a minute. I, like, you I don't, have your hand up. And I don't, I don't want to act like people are right to feel like this. Like people are right to be concerned about their privacy. Yeah, we want that. That's exactly what we want. Um, but we also want to be able to do new things to help people out that and to fundamentally change the market. And that means changing things. Um, and that, yeah, so we have to be able to change things and we cannot allow ourselves to be sort of bullied into changing them back out of, you know, out of fear, um, or out of worry or out of anything really. So, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Next question, please. Um, Hi, Michael. I have uh, two congratulations and two questions. Uh, the first congratulation is being uh, congratulations on the accidental timing that has everyone rage tweeting you uh, just the week before Chappelle's thing drops. Perfect. <laughs> um, and also congratulations on bringing interactive PDFs to the entire rest of the world that can't run Adobe. Uh, oh, that's a little that's a little thing that got missed maybe by a lot of people, but if somebody's filling out Canadian government forms until now, you could only do it on the freaking Adobe thing that doesn't run on Linux. Mm -hmm. And now it's my understanding this is getting built into Firefox. So congratulations and thank you. You're, um, I will pass on your thanks to the people who implemented that. Uh, before you get to your questions, um, this is, and I, sh I had that slide up where I showed, um, uh, where I showed that heat map of where people spent all of their time uh, interacting with the browser. Let me just do that one briefly, uh, or pardon me, uh, this one briefly that I had people interacting with the browser. That is uh, just a taste of the much greater effort that we put into researching where it is that people were like where it is people were interacting with Firefox, where it is people were were struggling with Firefox. Um, and like it, to, I would never have thought this because I am a member of this century and I think paper is largely nonsense, right? And PDFs doubly so. Um, like a PDF is basically a sleeper agent for a fax machine. Um, but the, uh, but one of the things that we found out in the product was that it turns out the people who care about printing at all care about it a lot, right? And the people who care about PDFs at all absolutely have to be able to have tools that work well with them. And the team that has worked on the printing and PDF situation uh, over the last year, um, I don't know if they're going to get a lot of love and a lot of glory, but they really deserve a ton for taking the great deal of the worst edges of legacy code out of, that, out of our product. Like we used to talk about the printing code in Firefox and people's eyes would sort of randomly defocus and then they'd change the subject. And that's just not the case anymore. Not for people who's working on it and not for the people using it. 
So well, it's especially important here because the Canadian government, bless their hearts, is using these interactive PDFs. And if you want to do things like, you know, file for all sorts of things to do with the Canadian government, this is their path of doing it. Mm -hmm. So uh, and they consider it accessible. <laughs> um, OK, so to uh, to the two questions Hit me. Uh, about the Firefox suggest, is that being blended at all with Pocket? Uh, I don't hear too much about Pocket, and I'm wondering, is that part of this plan in terms of suggestions and, and that kind of thing, or is that still going to be in its own little world? I have not heard of them talked about, like, I wouldn't rule it out. It seems like the kind of thing that eventually in the fullness of time would make sense, but that's not a formal statement because I can't, um, that's not, a, I'm going to say that's not an official position statement from Mozilla because I can't, um, I don't think we've talked about them, you know, being flagship features uh, for that thing yet. Um, it seems like the kind of thing that might eventually make sense in some abstract way of delivering value to a user through the address bar. Um, but I don't, I don't think that those things are tied together at this point. Okay. So, and, and, and the so last... that's, I'm, I'm just sorry, that, that does sound like I'm dodging the question. And it sounds like that because I'm dodging the question, but I, <laughs> no, I, I, I didn't take it that way. There's so much going on that if that kind of thing is lowered down the queue, I think you can be forgiven. Uh, the other question sort of dovetails into the good news you were saying about iOS, and it seems like the reverse is happening on the other side. I mean, uh, I've had the pleasure or whatever of working with Windows 11, and they've been aggressively through their news bars and everything. If you want to know sports scores, you want to know news, you want to know any information that's going to pump to you, they're force feeding you edge. And um, it seems like Microsoft has gone on more of a tear than ever in trying to, are you sure you don't want to use this? Are you sure you don't want to use this? If you want news, this is the only way you can get it. And I mean, the news on iOS is great, but I mean, is Windows 11 going to be one of these nightmares? They're going to do everything to make sure you're not the default. Uh, Microsoft's going to Microsoft. Um, they are uh, they're doing a couple of things right now that we find uh, distasteful. We have uh, recently uh, figured out as we we've recently figured out how in the product with one click you can set Firefox back to being what it was. Um, I don't think that we are actually going to lose a lot of our audience for that reason. Um, I think that it's like in the Microsoft, the the Edge HTTP, have, is that how it is? The Microsoft Edge HTTP links, where instead of having like a link to a web page, they have a link to a Microsoft Edge web page. Um, that is a thing that they have also done. Like they've registered Edge specific protocol handlers so that Edge specific pages can do presumably edge specific things. As uh, far as anybody can tell, they're not edge specific things at all. They're just web pages. They just really, really want you to use them in edge. Um, so I'm not sure how that's going to shake out. Uh, we have a couple of things coming. Uh, oh, we have a couple of efforts to make sure that users can get their choice. Um, and that, uh, well, we have a couple of things. I don't know how many of them I can talk about uh, to make sure that users will be able to exercise choice on that platform. Um, it's always like, as you might imagine, it's always dicey because having your, you know, <laughs> ha having your OS vendor periodically zero day your user base is kind of unpleasant. Um, and it's a challenge, uh, but we are, we are aware of that and working on it. We did have a comment. There was one tweet a couple of days ago where one of the, uh, where after we figured out how you can, okay, just yes, with a click, you can set Firefox to be the default browser for all the things Firefox handles. Um, there was a tweet from one of the edge engineers who was like, wait, that's illegal. <laughs> so, you know, you're not, not illegal, but like that, you're not supposed to be able to do that. And we're like, illegal. that was the result of the freaking antitrust case. No, I, I when I, I, I was, I was actually saying, wait, that's illegal in the sort of referring to a meme sense, not in the um, accusing them of a crime sense, tempting as that is. Um, but the, uh, yeah, they're, they're, it's a, it's an ongoing struggle. Um, and, and occasionally things there are tense. It's, it's a very odd, like 
a relationship with a company the size of Microsoft's is very, very odd because in some ways we work great with a number of their departments and teams. In other ways, um, we have these sort of like, we see what you're doing there. Why are you like this? These kind of conversations. Um, we are never going to feel only one way about Microsoft um, because that's where like most of our users are. Um, so there's always going to be, that's always going to be a, a challenging relationship. Um, who's next? Scott. Scott, go ahead. Oh, sorry, did you get two? That was two, Evan? That was two? Okay. <laughs> that was it. Hey, Mike. Um, somewhere in the last few months, I saw... You're, right, you're muted. Am I? No, he's not. I can hear I me. I can hear him just fine. I can hear both of you. This is actually... The, the circle of life has continued here because I believe it was about a decade and change ago that Scott got to see my presentation, <laughs> my audio presentation at um, up at Seneca fail catastrophically in much the same way. Um, so, <laughs> Can you hear me um, now? All right, so. Yes, no? No, we got nothing. Uh, Pulse Audio? Restart Pulse Audio? Have you, have you rebooted? I'm on Pipewire. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I, I can hear Scott just fine. That's the weird part. Yeah, Michael, I can hear both of you. Oh, all right. Well, That's let's try again. That's really weird. All right. Now, I well, Scott, a... ask your question. If you have to, we'll relay it. Um, oh, I'm, somewhere... I'm good. I, can, I, I did something on my end or reset, uh, reset my connection, so might have been me. No worries, Mike. <laughs> um, Sounds good. And to, to your quip, uh, I'm on Pipewire. <laughs> um, and life is much better. Um, so... Uh, <laughs> they make do they make one of those for system D? <laughs> we'll have that conversation later. Okay. Um, somewhere in the last few months, I saw a thread of uh, extension developers uh, complaining about long lead times for uh, extension update approvals. Do you have any visibility or comment into that situation? I do. I'm in the incident channel. <laughs> I know exactly what's going on. Um, and uh, I can't tell you. We expect it to be resolved very soon. We expect there to be an announcement of some kind about it, uh, which will be uh, something that we will have more news about, I hope, in the next 10 business days. Um, once we've got all that sorted out, uh, yeah. Um, the short answer is I know exactly what's going on, and I can't tell you. I'm Thank sorry. you. <laughs> When, Any other questions for Mike? When, oh, when, it, when, mm, when you find out what it was, you'll know why I can't tell you. So. You, go ahead. So everybody's got opinions and, and you want Mozilla to have opinions. What do you do when your opinions clash with your customers? Are you allowed to, do your customers have some kind of dial to adjust what your opinion is? I mean, that's a very abstract question, but feel, feel free to answer whatever part of it makes any sense. The changes that we have made as an organization towards how we handle data how we interact with and like what we do to aggregate say telemetry, um, what we do to aggregate our understand, like how we seek to understand our user base. Um, all of those choices have a way for you to opt out, right? There's always, there is always going to be a Firefox that you can just say, I don't wanna be a part of this thing that sends my information over the wire to whoever, right? And of course, it's not to whoever, right? It's to services that we have either built and owned outright or partners that we have trusted relationships with and so on. Um, but you have always got the choice to walk away from those, from the way that Firefox gathers information with a checkbox that is usable and discoverable. Um, then there's, there's no chance whatsoever of that changing. Um, that commitment to building things that you can 
always have like you can always have an all the way locked off default if that's what you want. Um, some of those things I should say some of those things are harder to find than others. Um, in the case of telemetry, you can opt out of telemetry. I'm pretty sure that's a checkbox. Uh, it's more challenging to opt out of you know more dangerous things um, like disabling updates and so on. Um, I've been a while since I've done that because I think it's a not a safe thing to do. Um, but you can always have like you can always walk away from that and still have a copy of Firefox that only looks at web pages and doesn't go anywhere. Um, or doesn't go or send any other information. In modernity, that's not always a great idea. Um, like one of the challenges of being on a modern internet is that the difference between uh, this is a theoretical vulnerability, you know, the difference between this is a theoretical vulnerability uh, and this is being actively exploited in the wild, sometimes that's ours, right? Um, sometimes like it is very rarely weeks anymore. Um, and so there's a lot of these things that are part of a healthy software, a robust and healthy software ecosystem requires the exchange of data so that we can update threat models so that we can update block lists, uh, like, you know, phishing lists, safe browsing sites, that kind of thing. Um, but if you don't want that, there will be a checkbox for it or an option somewhere and you can turn it off. Um, we make, we sort of understand the power of defaults um, as a market force. And we try really hard to make the defaults that we choose for the product, the ones that make the most sense for the most people um, in terms of safety and feature visibility or feature usability and, 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 and. We try to make the best choices there, but they are choices. And if you disagree with those choices, uh, there is almost certainly a checkbox for you somewhere or a pref somewhere. Um, and if you disagree with that, uh, you know, the source code is right over there. Um, I guess I was imagining that Suggest had an opinion, um, but I don't know. I've never used it, never seen it. But oh, um, the answer I think is not that Suggest is going to have opinions. Um, the answer is that Mozilla is going to have opinions about what should be suggested. Um, and that that is going to be a that is going to be some sort of like relationships between us and you know who we think trusted providers are, um, what sort of things they will be able to share based on what suggestions and so on and so on and so forth. Um, it's a complicated question. I don't think we've got a crisp answer to it at the moment, um, but it is going to boil down to um, we have opinions about how the internet should be. Uh, and about what a healthy internet looks like and what a healthy relationship with the internet looks like. Um, and those are the opinions that we're gonna have show up in the product. I guess one of the things I like about Firefox is I think mostly it's working for me, which isn't true mm -hmm. about the web in general. And you know, I, you know the who's paying, who's the customer and so on. I'm not mm -hmm. paying for Firefox, but I feel I'm the customer which is a good thing. Well, I don't know if you're paying for it or not. I think that in, in modernity, unfortunately, um, even if you are paying for things, you can still end up being the product. Um, there's a lot of that going around these days. Um, but I think that ultimately this is going to be an issue of uh, like judgment and experience for us and for our users, right? We are going to have new relationships with new partners who wanna provide new experiences to our users. We have strong opinions about how the discovery of those experiences can be delivered, right? That has to be privacy respecting, right? Once you go over there, of course, it's a website, right? And you'll be able to interact with that provider on some terms, but you know, we are the ones who's we are the ones who help you get there from here, wherever there is, wherever here is. And we have come to like, we have come to the stark realization that that imposes a burden on us in some sense, right? To make good decisions about where there is when we have that opportunity to make good suggestions, you know, to make sure here is safe, right? To make sure that the discovery of there is safe. 
um, to make sure that getting you from here to there is okay. Um, I'm sure these are sort of vague, like abstract questions. Um, the way we've talked about the newest versions of Firefox is like what we're ultimately aiming for is sort of a, I don't know if a curated experience of the web is the right word, that's probably not it. I'm thinking more in terms of like, you know, what is the guy, um, the word's not coming to my mind. Um, the person, uh, the front desk of a hotel, concierge, right? The concierge of a hotel, right? This is the good stuff in the neighborhood. This is what you might like. You've been here before, we've had a relationship. You might like this new thing over there. Um, yeah. So a positive experience with someone who is working for you. Um, and of course, again, if you don't, uh, if you decide to disagree with that, you'll have that option as well. Any other questions for Mike? You, go ahead. <laughs> is there a future for Servo and, and is that, and I think the answer is probably no. And if, is that damaging? Can it, can, can the code base improve in another way? That's a hard question that I don't have an answer to. I think that as we develop new features in the product, we are continuing to, as best we can, um, make engineering decisions based on like what is the, you know, what is the safest and most performant way to deliver this feature down at that sort of low-level engineering. And Usually that means when the opportunity to replace a component that's made in C or C++ uh, with something in Rust, uh, when that opportunity presents itself, uh, we are generally gonna take that opportunity. I don't know where Servo at the moment fits into this whole larger scheme of things. Um, that is like, because a rendering engine is a, a rendering engine for a modern web is a really, really big, complicated beast, as far as I understand it. Um, like the the specifications for how you're supposed to act as a web rendering engine is basically a phone book, um, and so it's a harder problem to rewrite. It's it's a very hard problem to componentize that in the same way that you would componentize out subparts of the engine. Having said that, um, you know Rust is fantastic, and the future is not written. Uh, so I'm not sure where that's going to go, but I'm hopeful. Dave, you have a question. Go ahead, please. Uh, so early you were characterizing uh, Firefox as being uh, the safe alternative. So I would be interested in a, and you were, you were deprecating AB comparisons, but uh, an AP comparison with, uh, say, Firefox and Safari, Firefox and Google, Firefox and Edge. Why, like, what are the what are the evils that are actually being perpetrated on us um, by those various okay. platforms? Uh, um, well, so Safari uh, is Safari is a good, if slightly dated, product. Um, they're doing good work right now, and they've updated a lot. Hey, this is Carter. Everyone, Hi. hello. All right, I'm going to finish up here. Um, uh, Safari is sort of lagging behind in terms of uh, performance and standards. It's not a, a, Apple does actually a good job of respecting user privacy and so on. Um, but they are also like, clearly the web is not the tier one focus for Apple as an organization when compared to something like the, the app ecosystem that is a uh, tremendously lucrative uh, for them. Um, in terms of Chrome, um, uh, I'm not sure what to tell you in terms of Chrome. I mean, it's, it's an advertising company. It's their thing, like following you around and showing you ads is how they make money. Um, and showing you just the right ads to change your behavior and make you buy things is, is how they make money. Um, uh, they're getting a little like Chrome. I don't, again, this is one of those complicated relationships, but the um, Chrome, I think, and Mozilla, uh, Google, I should say, and Mozilla, as far as web browsers are concerned, are starting to have divergent views about what add-ons should and shouldn't be able to do um, and how much they are going to be permitted to do in the future. 
Um, now that ad blocks are becoming a larger and more popular thing, that is making advertising companies pretty uncomfortable. And it turns out Google is a pretty big one. Um, so there may be limits to how much agency you will be permitted today or tomorrow or the next year uh, over shaping the content of the web as you consume it to your own needs, to your own desires. Um, and of course, the fact that they're just you know, tracking everything you do from cradle to grave is a different issue. Different issue. Um, Beyond that, what was it? Safari, Chrome, did you mention the third one? So for started from a design perspective, I should say that Edge has taken, I think, full advantage of the fact uh, that they no longer have to expend quite nearly as much effort as they used to on the engine. Like they have taken full advantage of the fact by you know doing interesting new redesigns of taking new approaches there. Um, I'm, convinced that edge is like well I, I don't have strong opinions about edge because i feel like it is like it it's essentially reskinned chrome um and its job is to drive traffic towards bing um and like okay i don't think that they're having a, like they have pushed really really hard to get their audience, like to get users of Windows to use Edge. Um, and it seems like that effort has kind of only sort of paid off, right? So I don't think, I don't know if people who are actively making choices about what software they use um, on a day in and day out basis are super excited about Edge, even though it often looks very pretty and they're doing some interesting things with the UI. Um, yeah, so I mean, Can I have- just ask about Brave just for fun too? No. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't. Um, uh, I'm not sure what to say there. They um, Brave has done a uh, uh, remarkable job of trying to catch whatever the latest technology trend happens to be. Uh, I don't know if they're still doing cryptocurrencies. Um, they did a whole bunch of things with, uh, like, they've grafted Jitsi, the uh, video conferencing tool, in there and then called it a service. So. Um, they continue to be, uh, I think, and I should see if they're still doing that, you know, ad blocker by default, and then they pay you in cryptocurrency um, until, you know, or pay you back and so on with cryptocurrency. Um, it's difficult enough to claim any of that cryptocurrency that as soon as that sort of rises, as soon as that rises to the level of being a nuisance for somebody who actually takes them seriously, then I'm reasonably confident that they've got a couple of exciting lawsuits in their future. Um, in the meantime, they've hitched themselves to the cryptocurrency bandwagon, I think, which um, is, well, which is a gong show um, and, uh, you know, and an enormous uh, Ponzi scheme, but not, not entirely true. Um, it is as if a Ponzi scheme and a pyramid scheme got really drunk together one night and did something really regrettable. Um, and now they have an arbitrarily large number of uh, children with names like Doge. Um, and, uh, you know, and if that's the, you know, if that's, that's the bed they want to lie in, so be it. Um, but if I was going to pick some, if I was going to pick something to do with my life, reskinning Chrome so that I could get involved in a cryptocurrency scheme is not it. Um, but, you know, Y'all do what you got to do. So, Q, you have another question. Go ahead, please. Yeah, you said the specs of a, a renderer were like a phone book. And I've been worried for some time that it was just you had to reverse engineer the behavior of Chrome because it's so dominant. Um, that's my pessimistic view. What's the experience from your side of the table? Is there, like it used to be you had to reverse engineer Internet Explorer from some ancient version, but um, what's it feel like to you? Uh, so there's a couple of different parts of it. One of the challenges I think right now is that web development as a practice uh, is largely like a crime scene. Um, in terms of uh, tooling, in terms of stability of development, uh, all very few 
very few software shops now will actually ship what you might call like what anyone would recognize as HTML, right? You're shipping JavaScript, occasionally Wasm. It's all like, it is not in any meaningful way a, it's not really a web spec. You know, what you need first of all is a JavaScript compiler, a Wasm compiler, um, or just in time compiler, I should say, which can, you know, parse and execute and run all of this code, which eventually becomes uh, HTML, which has more scripts and so on in it. The challenge is not like the, re the web rendering engine in terms of HTML and CSS. Like an aspiring collection of students could probably get that mostly right in a term. Um, I'm being facetious there. It'd, it'd take a smart kids a year, right? Because there's a lot of conflict in there. Um, but the fact of modern web development has made everything that is shipped through minified JS and WASM and so on, insanely complex um, in a way that is, uh, in a way that creating a, like creating a pixel per pixel identical result to that. Um, I'm not sure when the sea change occurred historically. Like the, the idea used to be that you ship whatever you ship, HTML, CSS, and so on, and it has to be like, and the other end will render it and the rendering engine will do its best and you get what you get. Um, and if something didn't work or if something didn't render, then, you know, that was, it was both the client, you know, and if the code was right, it was the client's responsibility to get that right. Um, but at some point that became both, we need to have several different layers of performant compiler in there while also reflecting exactly the pixel perfect layout that I made in Photoshop. Um, so yeah, if you want just a Java, if you want just an HTML web browser, that's not impossible to re-implement. Um, if you want something that'll re-implement the modern web, that's a much, much bigger question. Okay. Thank you, Mike. All right. I think we will, uh, we will let you have some final words and then we will wrap up for this evening. Thank you very much for having me again. Then it's always a pleasure to be here. Um, and it is a delight to be able to, it's a delight after the last two or three in a row uh, where the organizations had a couple of challenges to be able to talk uh, very enthusiastically. And I think honestly about um, work that we've done that really matters that we hope is gonna change uh, the web and change maybe the world a little bit for the better. Uh, and with a little bit of faith and good fortune, um, yeah, uh, continue to keep the web, uh, the live up of the promise of what we call, you know, the promise of the web that it belongs to everybody. Right, and it deserves to be free and open and accessible to everybody. Um, and to be safe, privacy respecting, all that good stuff. Um, yeah, I feel like it's been a good year. Let's string together two in a row. I'll see you next October. Thank Thanks you very, very much. much. And we look forward to seeing you again. I'll be here. And uh, thank you everybody for coming out. Um, it's been an excellent meeting and uh, we will see you uh, in November. Have a great night.